<clears throat> Excellent. So welcome to One Million Cups. I've got two devices working here because I'm in an odd place. That's okay. And uh, we are so happy to have you here today for a fun-filled presentation and a little bit of time for chatter after. So if you have an opportunity and you have the app, uh, please log on and, and check in so that we can see you here. But you can also find us all over, well, what we were just talking about, social media, either on Facebook or other places. So come check us out if you want to know more about what we do. Uh, but I know this is going to let me do it. There we go. So what is One Million Cups about? Well, the main thing that we do here is we try to build a community. And this community is based upon drinking coffee and, and figuring out how to build our, our businesses and our ideas into businesses. We do that through sharing, offering help, asking for help, and just supporting each other in general. And the difference between us and other types of uh, entrepreneurial uh, endeavors is that we're really trying to create presentations here, not pitches. We don't, we're not looking for, for money. Um, we also want people to connect. And by connect, we mean find ways to support each other and help each other, become part of that team. Uh, we are run by the community. We're all volunteers and for the community. So we're here to help you, the community, uh, learn and grow and develop, and we will do so along with you. And the one, one of the most important parts is that we're radically and intentionally inclusive. We bring it on. We love to hear about whatever you're doing in whatever field you're in. So the 1MC one one Nation happens all over the country, all four or five time zones, depending on the time of the year, all the way from the East Coast to Alaska. So there's over 168 communities. There's thousands of volunteer attendees every year or every, every week. And then every, uh, every week, there's hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. Okay. And during these meetings, the goal is for us to seek out education, learn, to have people practice their presentations and make these connections that we were just talking about. These happen at nice little places like you see here, the collective, I'm here today. Uh, when we get back to normal, hopefully we'll be able to meet in person and do the same kind of thing. But until then, we're gonna stay on our, our virtual. But over the, over the last couple of years, over 8,000 entrepreneurs have shared their story, which is an amazing thing. And one of the things you need to think about if you're looking at One Million Cups is, with your business, do you have all the answers? Do you feel like you know exactly what's going on? If you do, we're probably not your stop. You probably need to find a different group uh, to hang out with uh, if you're looking for help. But if you wanna help, this is a great place to be. So most people would say no to that answer and that's great because that's what we're here for. We're here to help you if you have any questions about your business. We have some sponsors that take care of some of the things. When we're in person, we have Seattle Strong. Uh, when uh, we are supported on our meetup group by a small studio and human up is supporting us in our uh, move to a different uh, email marketing system. So uh, thanks to them for all they do for us. We are run by a very small group of community volunteers here. You see us and in all honesty, we're looking for some more. We'd love to have two, three, four more people join on to do something small and interesting to help out this community. So if you're interested, please let us know. Today, on the other hand, though, we're going to have this. We're going to have some coffee and conversations, which we've already started. Now we're going to do a six-minute presentation by um, Sean's Toolbox. And then afterwards, 20 minutes of Q&A. And we're going to try to be very concise on this and try to end in 20 minutes. So I may, at the very end, um, I may end up cutting people off. I hope that doesn't bother you. But we want to make sure there's time afterwards for some real connection in our breakout room. So I'm going to kind of shut it, cut it short at about... Uh, 9.45 and then we'll be able to get into our rooms by 9.50 and have at least 10 minutes of hanging out and chatting. So if you're ready, I think the next and most important thing for me to do is share the screen and do this with our, our presenter. I'm trying to, trying to do this. I need to... Uh, just You can make me a co-host, I think. I'm <clears throat> right clicking on me. There we go. I got to find you. I know there's so many people here today. This is great. Participants. There you are. More. Make a co-host. You are a co-host, sir, as of right now. Wonderful.
All right. So everyone, this is this is Leif. He is from Sean's Toolbox. And take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out here all the way to your sitting room or bedroom. Uh, my name's Leif. And so I'm going to be presenting on my company called Sean's Toolbox. So you'll have to kind of wait till later in the presentation to understand why those are not the same name. Uh, I presented on this a couple months ago, like seven or eight months ago on a different planet, uh, One Million Cups. And this is kind of a bit of a uh, redo of some of that presentation and like an update of where I'm at and kind of new challenges I'm facing with this. So a bit about me, I am a person that likes to work with my hands. I'm a tinkerer, hands-on person. If I ever go to like a friend's house and there's some stale project there, I can't help myself but try to get into it and be like, hey, don't you want to fix this? It's kind of cool. It's like been sitting around. Um, that's like my, it's my MO. I like to fix old things. Um, and that's a lot more my comfort zone, much more so than like putting on a collar and sitting in front of a computer. But uh, this is also very important too, I think. So this is just me doing some random stuff throughout the years. Um, and with this desire to be very hands-on and learn a lot of things, I got really into um, cars. So um, there's me on a racetrack at home. That's more of like the low heart rate calming stuff. And this is me inside of a car, a uh, different car, of course. You have many cars if you're a car person. Um, so I learned that I like to work on the cars and break the cars and fix the cars and all that type of stuff. And I'm wondering here, who here has a car, by the way? They're car people. This is Seattle, so you got to ask this question. Not a lot of people have cars. All right, now, who here works on their car ever, does some small stuff? Nice. Okay, we have some. Good. This might be relevant to some people here. This is great. Um, so when working on your car, there's a lot of things to consider uh, tool-wise. So these are like universal tools you might use to get a lot of things done around the house. You all know what these are. They're wrenches and sockets and extensions, screwdrivers. Very helpful for cars, repair, lawn repair, house repair, all that type of stuff. But there's also a lot of other types of tools that you need to work on cars, which I learned early on in my car learning history. If you go through the manual, be like, all right, now pull out specialty tool number 8362 to do this one job. And now specialty tools look a lot like that. It's much different, huh? So specialty tools are something that you can think of in your head as being rare, or expensive, you know, very specific. Sometimes it's like, all right, this tool does a job for one year of one model of one make, right? And then it needs all these things. Cars have like tens of thousands of parts and all these different things that need to work perfectly together. Um, they're very hard to find these tools sometimes. And if you want to get the job done without a specialty tool, you need to have like a 10 times increase of like time and then like a ton more swear words and like a lot more broken skin. And then you'll maybe get the job done. You usually have to be very innovative and usually like a sawzall is involved. So specialty tools, very helpful. A lot of people just can't do this. They take it to the dealership. They get it worked on there. Um, so that was always a hang up for me when working on my own car. And I, I always wanted to work on my own. Um, so what I would do is I'd have to go find friends who had these specialty tools sometimes. Um, I had a really good, had a really good friend in back in my hometown of Tucson named Sean. So here's Sean, uh, my buddy. He had actually the same car as me, uh, one of the same cars as me. So us car people, we have multiple cars. Um, it's kind of like how people have multiple shoes if they're into shoes, but it's like a cheaper hobby actually, because your shoes usually depreciate and cars usually appreciate. So fun fact. Um, if you buy the right car, I should say. Most new cars do not appreciate. Um, so I could borrow my friend Sean's tools to go work on my car, bring it back and say, thank you. And that was great. Here's some beers. Um, but you might not need a tool like more than once or twice every 10 years. So it's like very expensive outlay of cash, use it once, and then you're kind of done with it, right? So most people don't own these tools. If they do, they're just because they're really big enthusiasts. Um, so I eventually acquired my own tools, wanted to like I found one that I had to get from South Africa and it was very rare and I found, got it shipped over here and it wasn't that expensive, but it was very hard to find. And I was like, great, I used it for 10 minutes, got the job done. And now I want to rent it out to people because other people need this and I want to make a bit of money. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, so I went to eBay to rent it out and they said, no, you cannot rent it out. Um, eBay, Amazon, all these online platforms, this is only a sales thing. They don't have any provisions for renting things out. Um, so the only other alternatives I've found so far is you can do forums. So if you're like on a, let's say you're into Toyota, so you're into Toyota forum, you're like, okay, I need this pulling tool for something for this 88 Toyota and you got to find it. All right, great. It's worth $400. Could you PayPal me, a random person on the internet, 
and I will send it to you and then that deposit, and then you can have it for a week and then you can send it back and you get the money back. So that works out, that's great, but man, that's a lot of friction and a lot of like PayPaling money out into the ether, um, which is questionable for sure. So the other option is you could sell a tool, maybe get it back later and buy it again. And it's just, there's not really a great platform in there. So that's where Sean's Toolbox comes into play. And this has been bouncing around in my head a lot. Um, Sean's Toolbox is going to be peer to peer. So like, I'm not gonna own a ton of tools. It's just unfathomable. There's like one car could have like a hundred specialty tools for it. And then those don't relate to the one after it. Like there's ten, hundreds, thousands of these things. And imagine like electric cars have their whole new set of tools. Hybrid cars have a whole different set of tools. Um, so it has to be peer to peer. You have to be an enthusiast and want to put them out on the market like Airbnb. Uh, it'll be national and shipping based. So, you, you know, it's going to be unlikely that the person that has the tool you need to do the job is going to be in your same town. So you have to ship them around. Fortunately, they're all pretty small. Uh, a lot of them, you know, they're kind of dense, heavy, but dense. Um, probably it'll be mobile first. I'm still playing around with that a little bit. And the business model is going to be fee based transaction fee. So kind of like eBay, where if you sell something, only if you sell it, if listing doesn't cost anything, if you sell it, they'll take like a percentage of that sale from you for their whole services. Um, and the big value offer Sean's toolbox will be insurances for your parts and tools, a $40 tool and shipping, making it very easy and the market of people that want to rent the tool from you. Um, so where I'm at today, I am trying to develop an MVP, a uh, minimum viable product. So I have done not a lot on this except for thinking about it the last seven or eight months because I've been working. Uh, so this is my renewed attempt to actually get going on this over the winter when we're stuck inside anyway. So I'm, I'm trying to come up with an MVP that's like a free service because it's, it's quite a jump to be able to say like, I can offer insurance, automated shipping and all this type of stuff as an MVP. So I'm thinking maybe at least the marketplace and get the user beta together. So it would just be a marketplace to connect people kind of like a forum, um, but more built on a marketplace. Um, and sorry, I just got distracted by a pop up on my screen. <laughs> uh, it's going to be probably ad supportive initially. So maybe like a banner out of the top, kind of like a forum, um, just one banner that's very specific. And just to focus on the user feedback cycle, do people even like this? No one is doing this. And there might be a good reason why no one's doing this. Um, and I don't know about that. I don't know how big the market is. I mean, you know, for me, old BMWs, the BMW forum has like 7 million users around the country or world. So that's kind of a huge ton of people um, and probably focused on a limited amount of brands. So these are the things I'm thinking about, um, how to go from the concept I have in my head, like I just talked about here to the customer requirements. Um, and I'm kind of playing around with the, what that looks like and how to minimize the bounce rate. I'm sure you've been there before you use a brand new service or an app and it's just like, you, it's really clunky and buggy and you're like, all right, screw that. You put it away um, and never, ever open it again and never think about it again. Cause you think, oh, that's a dead end. Try to minimize that. And then um, just, yeah, other ideas of how to test product market fit. So this is what my hope is that I'll have in the next month or two is to have a little landing screen for me to send people to, to start testing out and they can list their uh, tools and turn their collection of dusty tools into some side hustle money. Um, yeah, so that's my presentation on Sean's Toolbox. So thank you for listening and yeah. Thank you, thank you, Leif. So Leif, just so you know, that was eight minutes and a few seconds. Yeah. So you went a little, you, you did it too, so you, you understand. Uh, that's the way it goes. Yes. Yes. So um, I'm going to grab the screen back. We get us back on the on the road. So hopefully everyone can see that screen there. On the road. So uh, so what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be doing a little bit of feedback uh, to do this properly. Um, you should go and raise your hand. And the way to do that is to click on the little participants thing and then go down there and raise your hand and I'll start calling on people. If we could, we really wanna to focus today <clears throat> on asking very short questions that are essentially, well, I think people say they're one breath questions. And then Leif is gonna practice trying to give really quick answers. That way we can get as many people as we can through with all their answers, uh, questions and answers today. So um, I'm gonna start that by seeing who the participants are, and there is a boatload. And the first one on my screen is Sarah. Sarah. 
Hello. Um, I think it's a great idea. Thank I you. wondered if you have a strategy to deal with disputes. So I'm thinking if I lent a tool to someone and they broke it or they didn't return it, you know, what's my guarantee that that's going to be, you know, I'm not going to be out of pocket. Yeah, that's something that does keep me up. Oh. <laughs> uh, there, is an, there is an easy way to solve it. eBay, Airbnb, everyone has done it. I think I'm just going to copy and paste roughly what they do. And me personally not worry about it because like that's going to happen. You're right. It is going to happen. But I, I like worry about like feeling terrible about that every time. But like anytime you release a service, that's going to happen. So I think I'll just do find whatever best practices are and go for that. Would you be taking money through your service? Are you going to be holding it in escrow? And not initially. The first MVP, it's all going to be fight your own fights. <laughs> uh, it's just going to oh, be okay. connecting people like an online forum. Eventually, yes, I'd, it would be an escrow system and there would be some sort of management for that. Okay. Yeah, cool. thank you. It's like two breaths. Am I going to be in trouble, Eric? That was good. Uh, well done, sir. So uh, the next person up is Greg. Yo, I am okay. so excited. What's up, Leif? What's up, everybody? Uh, hey, Nate. I am so excited, dude. This is like, no offense to anyone else, and I hate the world of comparison, but like the first time I heard the idea for, oh, this is way more than one breath. I'm so sorry, everybody. I'll be really quick. First time I heard it though, I was like, awesome, dude, like this is going to be the next big thing in this, in this industry. Uh, so my quick question for you, sorry for the long winded thing is, what is your timeline to releasing your MVP? What are your biggest hurdles in the way and how can we help you surmount those hurdles? Wow. Okay, one breath. Um, timeline is, I, I, I want to not look back in some months from now and be like, wow, I sure did nothing. Um, and so I'm thinking by what the end of the year is a very traditional feeling for getting something done. So I, I'd like to get it done in the next few months, honestly, like it's going to be winter. It's going to be sit inside time, uh, crying out a project late at night. So that's one. And then hurdles right now are honestly my day job and my desire to buy a house. And so every hour I spend not cranking away at my day job, I will, you know, opportunity cost to like figure down payment. Um, so it's just those very direct things. And, uh, but I realize that this is way more of a passion project, way more interesting to me. So those are my big hurdles and just the unknowns of how to develop, come to market with something. Awesome, dude. If, if you care to hear any advice, I do. Yeah, no, I want to hear it all. <laughs> put off, put off buying a house. The housing prices are that, like nearing all time highs again. It's going to get corrected after the election. I would Good say. Luck, Greg. Good house. luck. Yeah, Good luck. We're having that discussion right now. Good luck. Yeah, yeah no, I, I am. I am. I'm ready to wear that. But, you know, the saving the money, that, that can happen anytime. I can happen now. <laughs> but I appreciate that. I also I feel the like In any way I can, dude. Thank you. So we have a message from. Uh, to Hannah, she says her mom and pop are, have dealerships and auto mechanics uh -huh. are always looking for a good partner. So something to think about right there. Okay. Um, yeah. Also, auto mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just something to think about there. Uh, next up is Ben. Hey Leif, uh, what a great idea. I love this. I'm not a, I love cars, but I'm, I don't get involved. Um, plus I've been in New York city. I haven't had a car for 20 years. But here's my kind of my question comment is I, I'm wondering if you've thought about maybe a specific kind of car or type of car, one or two, three models, because it seems you want to do it all. And I'm just wondering if you can cut it down to yours and Sean's favorites, where your passion is, you might be able to build a community around that. I mean, have you thought about that? Or are you still trying to do electric and ice and all this other stuff? Yeah, no, nice terminology, by the way, ice, internal combustion engine. Um, <laughs> I, I would say I'm, I'm right there with you. I, that's why I want to start out. And I said it really quick because I was running out of time. But like, I want to start with like one brand. Like, okay, this is going to be older BMWs, which is where I'll, my knowledge is mostly. Um, or my friend Sean, he's got an older Porsches. Two big, like, paying customers too, by the way. Um, 
but yeah, that's a really good point is just to focus on those ones and kind of, it's hard because you gotta say no to the other, you know, users that want to come and be like, can we use other tools and be like, not quite yet, but let's, I'll take your email address. Also, can I just add one thing? It almost, this almost sounds like it'd make a great subscription for X amount of dollars, you get X amount of tools per month. Hmm. Okay, I'm thinking about subscription models. I wonder what that would be like. That would be probably a scale, but I'll get to keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Always good to think about things like that. Next up is Jolene. Okay, I just have a really, what, like, I just want to know what BMW is your, like, real love and if you have an affinity towards one specific one. And the other one is, I just want to say, I love this idea. We've talked a little bit about this. I think, you know, if you are looking for some other um, input from gearheads that are totally loving um, doing this, you know, like I hung out with people, you know, reconstructing minis, you know, like old minis and fair ladies and, you know, but so mm -hmm. I've, I've got some inputters if you're, if you're looking for other people. I do, yeah. I, I'm actually going to be curating that in the next month or so of like list of people to be like, hey, what do you think of this? Like, it's a free service. Like, do you, do you want to list your stuff and look at it or whatever? Yeah. But yeah, there's all those people. The people that are into it, like you've seen, are really into it, right? Yes. And those are the people I want, the evangelical users. So yeah, I'll, I'll hit you up for user. Okay, but I want, the, what BMW is your oh, favorite? Sorry. Uh, old ones. So like, well, it's not even that old. Like, my favorite one is like, Early '90s, late '80s, three series with like a three eighty nine, a little tin box, and it's very. My fun. husband had a two thousand and two, oh. a nineteen seventy five. Like Those are good, good. Okay, I'm sure he feels sad about getting rid of that. Oh, it's everything. heartbreaking. Yeah, they're still available. Buy one this year before they go up. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Next up is Randy. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. Um, so um, a quick comment and then I don't even know if it's a question. It's more of a statement. Um, if you have a tool that somebody else needs and they're interested in using it for some purpose, to me, that's your MVP. Don't have to invest in technology or anything. That's it. Now the statement part is find, so the lady with the glasses that just spoke before me, she has a bead into your community. I would speak to those community people and find out what they're looking for, how often they would use this, what are their requirements. Mm -hmm. What seems to be missing from all of this is, as you might expect from me, is the customer. Who's gonna use this? It may not be car specific. It might be somebody who loves tinkering with cars. I might have a need to do it, but I may never do it. So, I, you know, find your community. The community is definitely out there. Speak to the community first and then think about all these other technical stuff. And then if, if people start asking you, oh, did you do this feature and that feature? Just say, well, thank you very much, but I want more feedback from you about how you would use it. Don't get distracted by the technical. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I as well landed because I do need to uh, think less about that um, and talk more because I, I do I do have like my community and the people that like this stuff and want to do it, but I, I should reach out to people that I don't know otherwise. So that's a good point. Thank you. Next up is David Shore. Hey, th thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you, Leif, for uh, this presentation. I, I also think it's a great idea. It sounds kind of like, you know, another aspect of the sharing economy. Um, what I guess my question for you is, uh, have you ever participated in a, a tool library? Because that's sort of what this sounds similar to. I think a tool library is more for, generally more for um, tools used around the house, uh, like like a ladder, if you need a ladder, but you only need a ladder once every year or two. Um, and uh, yeah, so like, 
I, I think I live in Capitol Hill in Seattle. I know there's a tool library somewhere in Capitol Hill. I've always yeah. thought about using it and have yet to, to try it out. Um, but I wonder if you have any experience with that. Yeah, so actually, uh, it's a good thing you bring up. I volunteer at the North Seattle Tool Library um, because of many reasons, affinity towards tools and just wanted to learn that whole process of what they do because it, I think they're very complementary to each other. Like you said, they're all in person. There's no shipping going on and they're more general tools. Uh, but the idea of tools changing hands is very helpful information of how that works and how people respect tools when they borrow them and what issues tend to happen. And uh, I'm actually volunteering that again tomorrow. But yeah, for those who don't know, tool libraries, especially in Seattle, there's two or three around and they're very like, you know, $50 for a whole year and you can go borrow whatever tools you want all the time. Um, very cool place, tons of things, like really good household tools. You can get a cider press, it's awesome. So yeah, thank you for the reminder. Like that's really good and it is useful space and you should go check out your capital one. Thanks, Greg. Awesome. Hey, Tessa, you're up. Hey, Leif. Um, you know, I love this idea. Um, I talked about it about boats and um, motorcycles. So my question is, you said that you're like, what's holding you back at the moment is that you have a full time job and you've got some like other possible priorities. Um, would you benefit from getting a like grunt work person who can do some like just some outsourcing for you or not even outsourcing, but somebody to work alongside you to do some of that grunt work? Yeah, this is definitely an Achilles topic for me. I, uh, I feel so much desire to do everything by myself always, all the time, no exceptions, which is nice in a few very small niche ways, but otherwise it's generally a bad idea. So I haven't really explored that much yet. Um, I was against it because I was like, well, I can just do it. <laughs> but you're right, I, I can probably find someone to even do this because I, I, I didn't even mention, but Bubble is a platform using it's like a no-code, low-code platform to release MVPs on. And I found people that will do it for like 20, 30 bucks an hour. Um, and I could just point and say, do that. And they'd love to do that. So that's a really good point. I need to revisit that and think about if I can or should or would do that. Delegation. Yeah, that's, a, that's lots of fun to try to find uh, someone that can do those things and then trust them. It's not easy. Yeah. Murgesh, my friend, you are next caller. Yeah. Hi, Leif. This is a... Uh... This was just fantastic. Uh, resonated with me in so many different ways. I think we had spoken about it briefly before. So I, I've got many, many questions, but I'll restrict to the first one. I think the big thing that you need to do is to think of this platform is how do you reinforce trust, right? trust and branding. Uh, one thought that I have is maybe, at least initially, you go with a membership model where people need to become members and in return for that, they get some benefits. And to test it out, maybe they even get free shipping. I don't know yet, right? So you can figure these things out. But the question is, will people be able to, will be open to upfront pay you to belong to this community? And they do, that's validation right there, right? That tells you how much farther you can go with that potentially. And the second thing I, uh, question I had is uh, the 90-10 rule, right? The 10% of the parts or tools are most in demand probably. Can you just test with, you know, um, 10 tools or something, at least in your MVP. I'm currently building a, a marketplace myself. I've got a pilot going at this point, do the same thing, get it down to a few tools and just work out all your kinks around those few tools, right? And whatever you need to compromise to do that, even if you had to pay for the tool, it doesn't matter, right? There's a lot of learning at every step of the way. When people use your, in the workflow, people use your service, there's gonna be learning. So it doesn't matter where you learn right now, you may have to compromise some to learn some. So those are some thoughts. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to compromise and like buy my own tools and waste money, waste money initially on it. Really quick question, how are you building your marketplace? How am I building the marketplace? Yeah. Yeah, I've been building it in a different uh, 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 scenario in the healthcare marketplace. Uh, we bring healthcare providers and consumers together. Right, so. okay, so your, yours is more virtual product. Not a physical. Yeah, it's a consult. Yeah, it's a point. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. That is a very helpful idea. And I, I think I have access to those nine out of the 90 percent of those most useful tools right now. Through people yeah, I just want to offer one more. My brother was the early guy at eBay. He took over from Pierre and wrote all the code. Wow. 
very early, 10 people selling pest dispensers. That's all they were selling that, at that point. Um, and my sister turned them down just because who the hell wants to buy pest dispensers, right? Uh, I didn't even know what pest dispenser was. When I went there. Um, so uh, there's some experience there. Then they built a company called Live Deal. So I can help connect you. Um, right. Somebody who's actually made strangers exchange physical goods, if you will. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of eBay. I've been on it since I was 11 years old. Yeah, because that's what they did, right? They, they got the trust worked out. Because at that point, when he came to me, I said, okay, so one stranger sells used goods, used goods, right? To another stranger, and they're happy the transaction. He said, yeah. I said, really? Um, and clearly, they worked it out over time, all the kinks they worked out as to how to reinforce trust in that used goods, goods transaction and make it work. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. The, the lens I want to look at is focus on the trust, like whatever small steps can be made towards making this feel like a trusting platform or, um, or like that's that the whole thing is that you're putting your thing out there and that people could have used tools and use them wrong, like hammering with wrenches and such. Yeah. Right. Hammer. And you see that happen even on the job sites where people are meeting freelancers or whatever, they can go off and do something outside the platform, right? It did not pay the platform fee of 20% or whatever they pay, but there's some value to be on the platform. You just need to figure that out, right? If you can get the, get that worked out, then you know they'll come back. They'll pay that value to be on the yeah. platform. Wonderful observations, thank you. Yeah, sure. Oh, we have one more hand raised right now. It's Johan. Good morning, life. Hi, Johan. Um, Good morning. It is fantastic to see you doing this again, and. Um, Is, is do you have um, databases or an online situation where people can sign up to either have tools to rent out and say, hey, I'm a renter or I'm a, I need to rent and what maybe tools they have available that you can start building a database of people that are your community? Because um, I, I know I've heard, I heard the first presentation as well that you did on Trump's Toolbox. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a great idea. And now more than and ever in the reduce, reuse, recycle, save the planet community and build less cars, I think you have a real, a, a more viable product than ever. I think it's getting your stadium, like looking like, like it's a football field. And are you feeling, filling those seats by having them come to a site and collecting their information? Does that uh, make sense? Yeah, that's no, totally like before the MVP, like get the, the, hey, what are you interested in doing? Any, any person I talk to say, hey, could you fill this form out? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, you gotta get, you, I, and I'm curious if you've done any of that to get people's no. kind of salivating for your product. Because no, again, before you build anything, you know, you need to start getting people going, oh, this is great, I want it, yeah, I have this to lend, I need a platform for this. And then you're gonna be able to have people to survey, and then you're gonna be able to see who's coming first that have tools. Because I, I would imagine that your platform is gonna become based on um, who needs the tool, like what tools are most in demand at the time. And then, then you'll be able to see the statistics later, but getting the people on board and you'll be able to say, okay, I need to build out at least four segments um, and it may be something you know it might be like oil changing tools might become the, the biggest thing on the market when it's sharing so right. i just i think that would be a really great thing to do for you because i know everybody's always excited about it but i don't know where to go and put like where would i have somebody put their name in to say i have this tool or i need this tool good observation and also bring up i i forgot about that entire industry people that are in into car repair for the uh reducing the waste of like junk in cars and things like that. I'm more just like a hobbyist and a lot of people I know are hobbyists. They enjoy the mechanics of it all. But yeah, you're right. There's a ton of people out there that are just, and I also like that too, is like, you know, we, want, we need to print more cars. We can just keep the ones we got. Um, and that is- Cuba, you, and you might look to Cuba. They might actually have something like that there because they are huge on older cars. Yeah. Yes, for very specific reasons. <laughs> and they, yeah. And they keep them in fantastic yeah, condition. Yeah, but yeah, sure. I love your idea. Thank you. Yeah, so um, piggybacking onto that, if you remember when we had a printy on, or supporty. Supporty. Su supporty, yeah. That, that, they, she mentioned that she had for almost a year a website up, and uh, Jolene mentioned that as well just here in the, in the comments, that having that website up and collecting some data, getting some feedback from people might be the first step to really tell you where that, first MVP, uh, that viable product is. So just something to think about. 
Uh, we have time, it looks like, for one more question. Mergesh is coming back around for a second chance at this, so, uh, and then we're going to go on with our stuff after this. So this is our last question. Mergesh. Hey, Leif, uh, one more thought. Um, can you think of what would be the delight, right? When they, is it when they open the package and find the tool or when they go and find a tool that they're looking for, whatever that is, is there one part you can test the A-B test just on the delight piece of it, where somebody gets so thrilled that happened that didn't happen before, right? Have a hypothesis of three things that they think are delightful and test each one of those things, right? That's easier to do than a, than a site and an MVP and everything else, right? I like these terms bring up delight and trust and so on. Yeah. Um, I think most people, the, my suspicion is the delight will be like when you buy the thing and it fits perfectly and it does the job and you need it in 30 seconds, whereas otherwise it'd be impossible. Then you put the tool away and send it back. Like that's the delight of like, ah, it just works so nicely. Okay. So they're actually going with a problem saying, I need a tool. I don't know what tool it is. And then they discover that tool. Yeah. I mean, I'm just throwing out what I think, but you're right. I have no idea. I need to find out from the users what, what might be that delight on mother. The okay. delight of not having to pay a gajillion dollars and spend a million hours trying to find this one yeah. tiny piece. That in itself is like value yeah. multiplied. <laughs> oh, for sure. Um, I just, uh, if I can just say something at the end here is that Leif, um, when you're doing your discovery, try to avoid interjecting your opinion. Because what it does is it stops people from giving you ideas. So just beware of that because it's happened here. Delight can come in many forms. It could be the opening of the packaging. It could be finding a community of people who share my interest. It could be finding people and that I could repair something that I never believed I could repair. I don't even have a need. But I found a community. It could come in. It could come in the packaging. It could come in the in the experience to your website. It's it's a reusable environmental. Maybe you'll change your colors to green. Who knows? Okay. So delight comes in many ways, and and try to avoid interrupting or undermining the very customers you seek to engage. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I uh, good stuff. I'm happy to hear what people say. Thank you. That was really, really good stuff. Everyone, great questions today as usual. And wow, I can't believe you guys actually took me to, took my suggestion of the one breath thing to heart. It's so, it was awesome. You guys made my day right there. That was my delight moment, was hearing all of your great questions and how we got everyone through this. So fantastic stuff. So at the end of uh, the One Million Cups presentation, we always ask our presenter this question. What can the One Million Cups community do for you? Good and question. before you before you answer, I'm going to give you a few more seconds. I just want to remind everyone, we're not really at, we're not really wanting, uh, after he does his answer and he gives you the ask, we're not asking for you to give him feedback now. This is your opportunity, a great opportunity to connect with Leif later if this, if this percolates in your mind and you have something you want to share. So uh, let's listen intently and see what this man needs. Wow, it's to build up. Um, so for me, I'm, what I'm really looking for is examples uh, of other platforms that are either peer to peer that you like particularly loved or were marketplaces or were knowledge bases of kind of what I really think my product will eventually become or anytime where there's shipping rentals. Like I, I'm eager to see what other examples of things in this sphere are out there and if anyone's come across them. And if you do, you can use the One Million Cups app or the One Million Cups website to email. There you go. Perfect. Thanks a ton. Um, so here's what you can do for the One Million Cups community, everyone who's here today, and that is bring a friend next week. Let people know that we're here, uh, especially if you know someone who's got an idea and they're just letting it bang around. So we would love to maybe help them Become the next Sean's toolbox. All right, you can also apply to present because we are looking for presenters, even though we've got a great pipeline right now. We're looking for people for November and December. So, you know, if you're willing to try something new, if you've got an idea, if you if you need to ask for help or are willing to ask for help, and if you want to just learn by sitting down and making a presentation, which is a great learning process, 
we think that applying to present in a nice safe environment with all your friends and your community is a great way to do it. So please feel free to go to onemillioncups.com slash Seattle and present uh, and, and apply to a present. Um, you can also, like we said, get involved by becoming an organizer. We are looking and we've had a couple people even mentioned in the comments that they might be interested. So that's fantastic. That being said, what we're going to do is we're going to go into some breakout rooms and uh, continue the conversations about today, whatever today stirred in you or whatever's on your mind. Uh, get into these groups and be one, two or three people and uh, go to at least 10 o'clock. I'll, I'll keep this going for a while afterwards and uh, have a great day. Thank you for showing up. We, we appreciate every one of you for coming and being a part of our community and making this a great and successful One Million Cups community. So if you give me one second here, I will go into breakout rooms. And while he says that, I want to say thank you everyone for all your feedback. That was really helpful. I uh, feel really <clears throat> jazzed about kind of pivoting back into this and really being intentional about it. So thank you everyone for your feedback and ideas. Yes, they are. Okay, so here we go. Um,